Hello, everybody, and welcome to our third lecture for CHY 113. I'm getting into the second week of the semester now, and so I hope everybody is starting to settle into their overall routines a little bit and getting into the swing of the semester with all of your courses. And so, just like last time, let's go ahead and begin today by looking at some warm up questions over what we uh, talked about last time. And so, just like we did before, the way this will be most effective is if you actually do go ahead and pause your video for all of these questions, try to do these problems, and see if you can come up with the right answers. And so go ahead and pause the video now and do this first question, which is performing these following metric conversions. And now let's take a look at the answers. So here we have our answers here of 548 nanometers. 1.21 gigawatts, just enough electricity to power a DeLorean. If you got that reference, kudos to you. Uh, we have 75.42 micrometers and 0 0.025 liters. If you did get those wrong, go back, look at your metric conversions, uh, um, try to find out where you went wrong. In a lot of cases, maybe move the decimal point in the wrong direction either way, uh, or just moved it the wrong number of places, but always take a look at what you did wrong and, and try to correct for that. Next, we're going to look at some significant digits. And so go ahead and perform these following calculations to the correct number of significant digits. And also be sure that you're providing the correct units when the question is done. Pause the video now, do these calculations, and we'll come back and look at the answers. And so hopefully you got these answers. For the first one, 10,000 meters cubed. The actual answer comes out to I forget what, let's see if I still have it on my calculator. When you put this into your calculator, you get 10,259.2. However, this is a multiplication problem and we only have one significant digit in this number right here, in this measurement here. Therefore, our answer has to be rounded to only contain one significant digit as well. And so we would round this one to 10,000. When we look at the units, we have meters times meters times meters. And so we end up with meters cubed. You can envision this being maybe the volume of, of some large room, perhaps, something like that. Next, we're going to take those same three numbers and we're going to add them up. When you actually go through the addition on this one, actually, it comes flat out to 77. I didn't look at that too closely. Um, so that, that comes up to 77. Um, but we would now look at the fact that we have digits in this that come to the ones spot. And so our answer would end up being rounded to the one spot as well, which just happens to be what this gives us. But let's say that, that we have some different decimals here. Let's pretend this gave us 77.265, something like that. And again, we would round it to the one spot because that's our least accurate measurement. This is the one spot, and this is an addition problem. Since we're adding, our units are just meters. Lastly, we had a density question, 2.658 grams divided by 3.20 milliliters. And so since this is division, we look at the overall number of significant digits. We have four significant digits here in our mass measurement. And we have three significant digits here in our volume measurement. Remember that this zero counts because it is a zero that is after the decimal point and after a non-zero digit. That means that this zero is significant and we have to count it. So we have three significant digits here. Therefore, our answer gets rounded to three significant digits at 0 0.831 grams per milliliter. Lastly, go ahead and try a dimensional analysis problem. What I want you to do here is convert 5.2 miles to kilometers, but I only want you to use these conversion factors. You might possibly know a conversion factor or be able to find one easy enough that goes directly from miles to kilometers. But I want you to use these conversion factors, these four specifically, to get in, into the, the flow of, of, of just using dimensional analysis and how we use units to, to uh, sort of walk us through and convert our numbers for us. So pause the video and try to set this a dimensional analysis setup up so that you can convert from miles to kilometers. And hopefully you got something that looks sort of like this. I sometimes set up little tables. It's, it's easier to do, especially in the presentation. Um, but so my starting information is here, my 5.2 miles. And then all my different conversion factors are just in a different box. And so we can see first that I'm gonna use the 5,280 feet per mile. 
and I'm setting that into my conversion factor so that miles will cancel out. So they're opposite each other. Next, I'm going to use, oops, ha, sorry about that. I should have included the inches per foot in the last one. So that might have thrown you off and I don't really feel like restarting the video. So I apologize for that. You might have found it a little bit difficult, but hopefully you, you, you maybe threw that one in there and, and were able to do that. Um, but so we need inches per foot as one of our other conversion factors that I should have included up here. And so next we're going to use that one then and convert over to feet. And again, we see that feet cancel out and so forth. We're going to use our next conversion factor, our 2.54 centimeters per inch, set up in such a way that inches cancels out. And then a couple of metric conversions to finally get us over to 8.4 kilometers. So I do apologize if that threw any of you off and frustrated you a little bit not having the inches and feet. Um, but hopefully you see what the setup is and you've been practicing some of the dimensional analysis because it is going to be a very powerful problem solving tool for us. Uh, and it will, it will help you get right answers if you learn how to use it properly. So there's our warm up questions for today. So now let's go ahead and move on to our new material. Today we are starting in with looking at the basics of atomic structure. Sorry about that. And so we're going to start to look at how atoms are actually arranged. And so when we look through sort of this, this chapter outline and the information in the next couple of lectures, we're going to start off today by looking at atomic, basic atomic structure, what makes up an atom. We're going to define a couple terms that we'll use, atomic number and atomic mass, and how those terms help us to determine the number of individual particles within an atom. We'll look at something called isotopes, which are different types of the same kind of atom. Atomic weight is related into isotopes. And then finally, we'll look at a bit at the periodic table and how the periodic table is structured with atomic mass in mind. In the next lecture, that's when we're going to move on to looking at, at formulas and names of chemical compounds. And so today we're focused in on these top five objectives here. And so an actual atom, and so the, the smallest part of, of, a, of an element that retains the properties of that element is an atom. You, you've probably hopefully heard that in various science classes up to this point, uh, and that atoms are quite often called the basic building block of matter, because they are the, the smallest, like I said, the smallest piece of matter that actually retains the properties of that element. So if you were to take a gold bar, pure gold bar, chop it down, chop it down, chop it down, you would eventually get down to one single atom that was still gold. You would not be able to chop that down any further and have it still be gold. And so an atom is, is that very basic fundamental building block of all matter. And atoms are made of smaller particles. And these smaller particles are charged, either positive or negative, or some are neutral, uncharged as well. And, and so it was this, this electrical nature of the atom that was really crucial to discovering what the real subatomic structure was, to, to finding what the actual parts of an atom are. We're not going to go into that historical perspective we, we, for this course. We just don't have the time. Uh, but that is something that I would encourage you to maybe look into because it is, to me, it's just fascinating science. When, when you look back at the work that some of these scientists did in the 1800s, in order to find the electron. J.J. Thompson with his cathode ray tube, uh, and then Ernest Rutherford with his famous gold foil experiment to discover the, the nucleus of an atom, and then eventually the proton, which Rutherford discovered as well. It really is just fascinating science. Uh, and those are the first few sections of, of the, the chapter that we're, that we're on now in the book. Um, and again, I'm not going to ask you questions about that. I'm not going to hit you with, with test questions specifically about the people and you know, whatnot that did some of this work. But I, I do think that it is just fascinating science to look into. Um, and it's just really cool stuff. So I would encourage you to look into that. But what they eventually discovered, like I said, were, were the different parts of an atom. And so we have the basic, basic atom here. And what we have is the nucleus which contains positively charged protons. And most atoms also contain neutrally charged or neutral neutrons in the nucleus as well. And so the, the atomic nucleus, the atom, or sorry, the nucleus of an atom made up of positively charged protons and neutral neutrons all held together. 
negatively charged electrons are then floating around outside. For now, for everything that we talk about from in the, in the near future, we're just going to envision electrons as being outside of the, the nucleus in some way. One of the topics that we're going to cover later in the course is there is actually a lot of uh, structure to how the electrons are actually arranged around the nucleus. But we're not going to get into that now. For now, we're just going to say electrons, negatively charged electrons, zipping around outside atoms and so what we're going to call an atom for right now are neutral meaning that the number of protons the number of positively charged protons are going to be equal to the number of negatively charged electrons later on in fact just in the very next lecture we're going to talk about ions which which are cases where that is not the case where the protons don't equal the electrons but if we're talking about an atom in its standard state the number of protons equal the number of electrons, making them electrically neutral overall. The bulk of the mass is in the is in the nucleus there, in the in those protons and neutrons. Electrons, especially in comparison, are pretty much massless, uh, and so there, there really is not much for for mass at all associated with the electrons. They're pretty tiny. We'll talk about the number of neutrons and the number of protons and how we find these numbers in a little bit. Um, but for now, just like I said, just know that, that the huge bulk of the mass in an atom actually comes from the nucleus, from those protons and those neutrons. Most of the atom is empty space. And so again, we can sort of see the depiction of it here with our, our nucleus here in the middle with our protons and our neutrons. And then the rest of this, with all these little dots inside, these are all the electrons zipping around outside. An analogy that I really like is when we think about sort of the, this empty space idea of the atom, that the atom is mostly empty space, is if you picture an entire atom to be the size of something like the Houston Astrodome, some huge sports dome. Now imagine one baseball hanging in the very middle of that dome. So the whole atom is, or the atom is the whole dome. We've got a baseball hanging in the middle. That baseball is the nucleus of the atom. Now we've also got, let's say, maybe about 10 mosquitoes buzzing around throughout the whole entire dome, the rest of the dome. So we have a baseball in the middle of the dome and a bunch of mosquitoes flying around outside the, or just in the dome, random spots. Those mosquitoes are the electrons and just buzzing around wherever they want to go within the rest of that whole dome. That's a pretty good depiction when we start to, to think about the, the sizes of, of these subatomic particles that most of the atom really is that empty space where the mosquitoes are buzzing around. But the vast bulk of the mass actually resides in that baseball hanging right in the middle. And, and so that, that's just a good way to think of the, the space and the various sizes involved, relative sizes when we're talking about the size of these, these subatomic particles. And so the first term that we have to really define is the atomic number. The atomic number gets a letter, Z, but that just means that when we're thinking about a certain element, we're thinking about the atomic number, we would say that Z equals and then whatever the atomic number is. All atoms of the same element have the same atomic number, which is equal to the number of protons in our nucleus. And so that, that's the big key, that Z, the atomic number, is equal to the number of protons in the nucleus. And that is the big identifier as to what an atom actually is. That determines the identity of an atom. The atomic number of aluminum, for instance, is 13. That means that aluminum atoms, all aluminum atoms, have 13 protons in their nucleus. That's the very definition of aluminum. Anything that has 13 protons in the nucleus is aluminum by definition. And we can see aluminum, for instance, right here in the periodic table. And in most periodic tables, for I think every, the atomic number is always somewhere towards the top. So we can see the 13 right here. That's one of the ways that you'll be using the periodic table as we move through the semester, is to be able to look and see what the atomic number is of various atoms. So the atomic number of aluminum, 13. The atomic number of carbon, 6. Carbon atoms have 6 protons. 
cadmium atoms have 48 protons. Lead atoms have 82 protons. Iodine atoms have 53 protons, and so on. And, and so we're able to see how many protons an element has just by looking up the atomic number on the periodic table. Now, when we start to think about how much an atom weighs, the atomic weight of an atom, the, the weight or the mass of an atom is, is relative to another. So for example, an oxygen atom is approximately 16 times more massive than a hydrogen atom. Now we do, that means that we do have to introduce a standard. And so the standard mass of an element is based upon the mass of the carbon 12 isotope. We'll talk about isotopes in a minute and, and see um, what we mean there. And so the atomic mass of carbon 12 is precisely defined by 12, as, as 12 atomic mass units. Don't worry so much about some of these numbers. In fact, for now, when we think about atomic weight, we're just going to think in terms of these atomic mass units. And we'll look more at what that means in a little bit. But just know that for now, that's how we're defining it and, and talking about the mass of an atom or the mass of an element is by these, is using these, these units that we just call atomic mass units. Now, atomic mass or atomic weight is very different from the mass number. They're related but they are different. So we can find, not related to this, we could find the number of electrons in a neutral atom just by finding the number of protons. All right, remember we said that the, um, that, that atoms for now, stable atoms are, are neutral. And so they're going to have the same number of protons as they do electrons. And so an oxygen atom, eight protons in the nucleus, and so a neutral oxygen atom will also have eight electrons on the outside. We don't have the same ability to, to, to just compare like that when it comes to the number of neutrons, however. For the number of neutrons, we use something called the mass number for every type of element. The mass number is equal to the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. And so if I was to say carbon-14, for instance, what I'm giving you there is the mass number of that particular type of carbon. And so that 14 is the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. And we often note or use this sort of notation, where x here would be the symbol of the element, and that in the case I just mentioned would be carbon. The mass number, 14, would be written as a superscript to the left. And then we would write the atomic number as a subscript to the left. In this case, carbon would be six right here. We don't always see that subscript Z for the atomic number, because remember that we can find the atomic number just by knowing what the atom is. And so quite often you might see, for instance, carbon 14, you might see written in a couple different ways. If we're writing it out, you would see it written just like this. You might see it written like this with both the mass number and the atomic number. Or you might see it written without that atomic number. You might see just 14 carbon written like this. Because we can see that it's carbon and say, OK, we're going to look on the periodic table. And we know the atomic number is 6. So sometimes you'll see that there. Sometimes you won't. Depends on, on what resource you're looking at, really. And so carbon, being a good example, so carbon-12, with a mass number of 12, has six protons and six neutrons. And so let's actually take a look at different types of carbon here. So carbon-12. We also have carbon-13 and carbon-14. Now let's look at the different uh, types of subatomic particles in there. Let's say I want to know the number of protons. These are carbon. They're all carbon. So I looked again on the periodic table. The atomic number of carbon is six. And you'll always be able to use a periodic table on all tests, everything that you have. Periodic tables are standard material that you'll just always be able to use. Um, and that's just, this is just as a side note, there are a couple that I would recommend. If you go to my departmental webpage, which is easy enough to find if you just go to, if you go to the USM Department of Chemistry, 
you can find my page on there if you look around. But I've got a couple of printable periodic tables on there. Here's the black and white one, which would be your allowable material on exams. And this is a decent color one. If you just wanted to print one off, a good color one to have available for you at home when you're working on things. So again, just, just an aside, uh, but those are a couple of options for periodic tables for you that you can always have out and about when you're working. Okay, and so these are all carbon. So they're all going to have six protons in the nucleus. If we then look at the number of electrons, these are all neutral carbon atoms. So they're all going to have six electrons in the nucleus. But now I look at the number of neutrons. And so remember that this mass number, this 12, 13, and 14, remember that our mass number equals our number of protons plus our number of neutrons. And so if the mass number is 12, and I know that the number of protons has to be six. That means for carbon 12, my number of neutrons is six. For carbon 13, mass number is 13, protons plus neutrons is 13, protons is six. So I have seven neutrons in carbon 13 and eight neutrons in carbon 14. And there we have it. So we have these three different types of carbon then. We have, we have carbon 12, carbon 13, and carbon 14. They all have six protons in the nucleus because that's what makes it carbon, but they all have a differing number of neutrons in the nucleus. <laughs> that's what an isotope is, sorry. So isotopes are just, this, the same type of element, but with differing numbers of neutrons. And so what we have here are three different isotopes of carbon. And that's all it is. These are three naturally occurring isotopes of carbon. And this is just another example, but with fluorine, and so fluorine atomic number is nine. So there are nine protons in the nucleus, nine electrons. If we're talking about fluorine 19, then that also means that there are 10 neutrons in the nucleus. And we would simply depict it just like this. There's our mass number. And sometimes you would also see the atomic number. So fluorine 19 has nine protons and 10 neutrons in the nucleus and nine electrons outside. And so the existence of an isotope or isotopes in general means that not all atoms of an element are completely identical. We can have different isotopes with differing numbers of neutrons in our nucleus. And so actually we've already really talked about this. This is just the way that we write uh, different isotopes with our element symbol, mass number, sometimes atomic number. This is just another example, three different isotopes of hydrogen. We have hydrogen one with one proton. And so that would have zero neutrons. And so hydrogen one is just one little proton and that's it in the nucleus. We call that protium. Hydrogen two, so a mass number of two, still hydrogen, so still one proton. But now since it's hydrogen two, that means we have one neutron in there and that's called deuterium. The last hydrogen isotope, hydrogen three, mass number of three. So now we have one proton and two neutrons in there. And that's tritium. All with atomic number of one because that's the, the atomic number of hydrogen. And so go ahead and pause the video now and see if you can come up with the answer to this question. You just wanna know which of these following statements is true. And so pause the video and see what you can come up with. Okay, so let's check it out. So boron 10, the boron in general, right here in the periodic table, atomic number is five. So automatically we know that, that boron is going to have five protons in the nucleus and it's going to have five 
electrons. And so if it's got five protons in the nucleus, then we know D can't be right. If it has five electrons, we know A can't be right. So that brings us to either B or C. Boron 11 has 11 neutrons. Well, that can't be true because the mass number 11 is the protons plus our neutrons. So that can't be all neutrons because we know there are five protons. So C has to be the right answer. Boron 10 will have five electrons to balance out the five protons. Now go ahead and pause the video again and try this one. Try to, to, to find the similarity between chlorine 37 and calcium 40. And see what we have similar between those two isotopes, those two different isotopes of different atoms. So pause the video now, see what you can come up with for an answer. So let's take a look at that one. So we have chlorine 37, what was the other one? Calcium 40. So it might be helpful for us to, to go through our, our breakdown of the number of each type of particle. So number of protons, number of electrons, and our number of neutrons. So chlorine, atomic number 17, 17 protons, so it'll have 17 electrons in there. Mass number is 37, so that means we're going to have 20 neutrons. Calcium 40, calcium is right here on the periodic table. Number of, atomic number 20, so number of protons is 20. Number of electrons then is also going to be 20. And the number of neutrons therefore will also be 20 because this is calcium 40. And so hopefully you saw where those numbers come from. If not, go back and review some of the stuff that we've talked about. Make sure that those numbers make sense to you. And so we can see then that what they have similar is our number of neutrons. They both have 20 neutrons in their nucleus. And luckily, that's one of our options. So C is the answer. We're not going to really talk about mass spectrometers much in this course or, or use them. But I just bring them up here to point out that there is an instrument which we can actually use to help us differentiate between different isotopes. Something that, that can actually measure so, so precisely and down to, to, to such a small scale that it will allow us to see differences even of one neutron within the, within the, the nucleus of atoms. And so one of the things that we can use a mass spectrometer for is you, uh, if you can really see it here, but here we have three different types of neon, neon 20, neon 22, and neon 21, which are all coming through the mass spectrometer here, taking different paths. And so one of the things that we can then use a mass spectrometer for is to tell us what the relative abundance is of each type of isotope. What that is, is so for instance, when I talked about carbons 13 or 12, 13, and 14, all three of those different carbon isotopes do exist in nature, but not in the same amounts. And so carbon 12, carbon 13, and carbon 14, if we were to look at all the carbon in, in the universe, well, presumably the universe, but at least on Earth, all if we were to look at all the carbon on Earth, roughly 98. 0.93% of that is carbon-12. Another roughly 1.07% is carbon-13, and there are trace amounts, but not a heck of a lot of carbon-14. And so most of the carbon in, on Earth is carbon-12, with some carbon-13 mixed in and, and the sprinkling here and there of carbon-14. And so that's one of the things that a mass spectrometer enables us to do is to find these abundances, it is to look at how much of particular elements are consisted of, how much of a sample of particular elements is made up of the relative isotopes. And so for instance, you can see that here. And so this particular reading is giving us abundances based upon the most abundant. And so this is telling us that for boron, Boron 11 is the most abundant, 
but roughly, what, about 25% or so of the boron out there is boron 10. For chlorine, chlorine 35 and chlorine 37 both exist. But roughly, what, a little over 30, 33, 32, 33% or so of the chlorine out there is chlorine 37. And so each isotope is represented by what we call this relative abundance. And so how much of the of particular samples are made up of which particular isotope. To calculate percent abundance, what we have to do is take the number of atoms of an individual isotope. So in other words, for my carbon example earlier, let's say that we had 100 carbon atoms total. 98.9 of those are going to be carbon 12. And so 98.9 here divided by that total of 100 and then simply times 100 to convert it to a percent. And so the percent abundance is the percentage of the total element that is that particular isotope. And so for instance, you know, back to our carbon example, carbon 13 has about a 1% relative abundance, meaning all the carbon out there, all the carbon on earth, about 1% of it is carbon 13. That's the percent abundance of carbon 13. So the atomic weight, back to this that, that we mentioned earlier. And so I'd mentioned that, that atomic weight, we're thinking in terms of something that we call atomic mass units or just units. The atomic weight that you see on the periodic table. And so for instance, when we look at carbon, 12.0107, if I just maybe bring up, so you probably, yeah, we can really let's zoom in there. There we go. So carbon 12.011, uh, some of these others, something like copper 63.546. This is the atomic weight of, of an element. This atomic weight on the periodic table is a blended average of all of the different isotopes. And so for instance, copper, if we were to take, or copper has, I think if I remember right, three different stable isotopes, which will all have slightly different masses because they have different numbers of neutrons. And so this 63.546 takes into account the mass of each of the isotopes, but also takes into account their relative abundance. And so, for instance, if we were to, I was trying to think of a good analogy for that. Um, I can't think of one off the top of my head, so I'll just leave it at, at what I said. That, that this, the, the atomic mass, the atomic weight that you see on the periodic table is a blended average of all of the different isotopes taking into account the abundance of each isotope. And so let's look at what that really means. And so here's an example with chlorine. And so chlorine, as I had mentioned earlier, has two different naturally occurring isotopes, chlorine 35 and chlorine 37. Chlorine 35 about, accounts for about 75.53% of all the chlorine. And we have its mass here. The mass of chlorine 35 is this here, 34.96885 atomic mass units. 24.47 of the chlorine out there is chlorine 37, which has this mass. And so we want to calculate then the average blended atomic weight. I think my next slide actually does have this done out in the PowerPoint, but I want to just show you a calculation of this by hand. And so let's just recap what we have on this slide here. I'm just going to write it out. And so chlorine 35, 5.53% of 34.9685 atomic mass units. Zero. Okay. So there we are. And so we want to calculate the actual blended atomic weight that we see on the periodic table. What we're going to do is we're just going to take each element and multiply the, the actual atomic weight of each 
by its percent abundance. Now we do want to convert these percents over to fractional numbers. So we're just going to divide each of those by 100. And so chlorine 35 then is going to contribute 0.7553. That's simply my 75.53% converted to a, to a fractional number. The mass of chlorine 35 is 34. Point nine six eight eight five and then we're going to add what chlorine 37 contributes chlorine 37 percentage 0.2447 times its mass of 36.96590 and so then we put that into a calculator got 0 0.7553 times 34.96885 plus 0.2447 times 36.96590 and I get 35.96590 We quite often will round doing these types of problems to two decimal places, 35.46 AMUs. I look on the periodic table for chlorine, 35.453. Pretty much the same. You'll, you'll, you'll see some, some small differences here that would be differences in rounding depending on how this was calculated for this particular table or how I might have rounded as I went through it. Um, but that's basically the same. And then this is just the same thing done out. It's the same exact problem. This is another way to, uh, th that we can use this. So, and we're gonna look at some different math here. So in this question, we're given the stable isotopes of copper, copper 63 and copper 65, we're told what the, come back to me, here we go. We're told what the masses are of those, copper 63 has a mass of this, copper 65 has a mass of this. We're also given what the weighted atomic weight is from the periodic table. So we look up on the, on the periodic table, copper 63.546 AMUs. From this, we can actually calculate the percent abundance of each of the two different copper isotopes. And so this just requires a little bit different math, or it's just a little bit more complicated algebra is all it is. And so we're told in this problem, copper 63 has a mass of 62.92960. Atomic mass units. Copper 65 has a mass of 64.92779. Atomic mass units. Pull the blended average is 63.546. And ultimately, we want the percent abundance of each. And so, what we can do then is we're going to set, for now, since we don't know them, we're going to set the percent abundance of copper 63. We're going to say the percent abundance of that is X. We don't know it yet. Now, we're told that copper only has two stable isotopes. And so the percent then for copper 65 is going to be 100% minus x, right? The two stable isotopes have to add up to 100%. And if copper 63 is x, then copper 65, that three bothered me, then copper 65 has to be 100% minus x. Now we can just plug this all in, into, a, into a formula for us or in, into, into some of the math that we were just looking at. 
And so we know that the blended average is 63.546. And so that's going to equal my X, my percent abundance of copper 63, times the mass of copper 63. Plus, now is 100% minus x, and change that to a fractional number like we did in the problem before. So I get 1 minus x, then times the mass of copper 65. And then I can just carry out the math. So my first step is I'm just going to distribute through my x's. So that's just, that's just distributing my X's there. Next, I'm going to go ahead and just subtract the 64, just to show you, just to look at the algebra of this. What I need to do is condense my non-X terms and then also condense my X terms together. So first, I'm just going to subtract 64.92779 from both sides. When I do that, I get negative 1.38. 179 equals 6229960x. So I, my x terms are still together over here. But now let's go ahead and simplify my x terms. And now finally, I can simply solve for x. Divide both sides by negative 1.99819, and I get 0.6915 equals x. Now remember what we said x was. x was our fractional abundance of copper 63. And so 1 minus x, our copper 65, has to be 0 0.3085. And then if we scale these up to percentages, that means that copper 63 accounts for 69.15% of all copper. Copper 65 accounts for 30.85% of all copper. Now, I always really like doing a problem like this early on for a couple of reasons. One is, is it shows you just some of the, just how we would can uh, use weights like this to find the abundance, just you know shows you what we're doing. But I also like to show the type of algebra that you're going to need to be able to do in this course. If you are uncomfortable or if you're having trouble with this whole setup here, if you're having trouble with, with that sort of algebra and manipulating equations and, and combining variables, then you need to definitely go back and review some of your, your basic math skills and basic algebraic skills. This is something that we are going to be doing a, a fair bit through the course is some math at this level. So if you're having trouble with that, then, then you need to, to find a way to overcome that. Maybe working with a math tutor at the Learning Commons, uh, maybe working with, with one of our LAs a little bit, maybe request an LA run a session that, that focuses on some of this math, something like that. Um, but this is, this is very indicative of the type of math that we're going to do in this class. So that is something that, that you need to be comfortable doing. And so finally today, let's just look a little bit at how the periodic table is set up. And so elements were first arranged in order of increasing atomic number. And this was done before something called electron configurations were known, which is something that we'll talk about later in the course. It was found that properties of elements are what we call periodic. In other words, every so many elements, properties would return. And so this was also something that Dmitry Mendeleev, especially, and also Lothar Meyer used in setting up what we now know as the common periodic table. And really, especially Dmitry Mendeleev. 
Russian scientist who developed what we now know as the modern periodic table, pretty much set things up the way that we see them today. And so what he did is he was setting things up according to increasing atomic number. And he saw this repeating pattern that every eight elements properties would start to repeat themselves. And so he started to set things up then with, with those peri, um, those elements repeating themselves, the properties repeating themselves, he set up into columns. And so he would start a new row and put elements that behaved similarly in the same column as each other. And one of the really cool things that he was able to do is when he did that, he found gaps in the periodic table. And so for instance, let's take a look at what I'm, look, what I'm talking about here. So Mendeleev you know, was maybe working with this portion of the periodic table. And what he found was he said, okay, I've got this element called aluminum. And that actually has very similar properties to an element called gallium. And so we're going to put those in the same column. This element here, germanium, hadn't been discovered yet. Arsenic had. And so Mendeleev, though, looked at this and said, well, arsenic doesn't behave like silicone, which did exist at that point. He said, arsenic doesn't behave like silicone, so I don't want to put it here, because that, that sort of messes with this, this thing that I've got going on. He said, but arsenic does have very similar properties to phosphorus, so I want to put it in this column here. There wasn't anything that we knew of that would fit into this column using the, the sort of the rules that Mendeleev was developing. And so what he said is, is he took things even a step further and said, and he saw that in a few spots in the table, he said, those empty spots, I'm going to leave them blank for now. Those are elements that we just haven't discovered yet. We will eventually discover an element that fits into that spot. And he was absolutely right. He, he, um, so he had left that open. This is in the case of germanium here. He was able to go so far as to predict what the properties of those elements were. And then when they were eventually discovered, most of those properties were dead on. Uh, and this was, this was some phenomenal science. He's, he's one of my favorite scientists just for that reason. The, the reason that he was, and again, this is sort of my take on it, but he was so arrogant that he was able to say, this way that I'm setting the table up is right. We can use this to predict properties. And in order for me to be right, that means we haven't found this element. When we do find it, it's going to have these properties. And, and he was dead on. I, I think that's just a fascinating story of science right there. And just so a little bit more on how the periodic table is set up, and we're going to get into more about this much later in the semester as well. But periods are our horizontal rows are called periods. So period one, period two, period three, period four, and so on. We have, and then also rows are the same as periods. We have columns. And the columns are actually not on this. So I didn't put that heading on here, but those are different families. Metals, and again, we'll, we'll look at a, a lot of these, these definitions later on as well, but we have metals on the left-hand side of the periodic table. We have sort of this, this little stairway here. Everything to the left of that are metals. Everything to the right of that are all non-metals. With metalloids here in the middle. We have several different families of elements, which we'll be talking about a fair bit. Our first column are alkali metals, alkaline earth metals. This whole big section here in the middle, these are all transition metals. We don't really have names for, for these columns here, for sort of this block. But these here are halogens and finally noble gases. And we're going to talk about a lot of these as we go on. I just like to introduce some of these terms now because I will be using them as I talk about regions of the periodic table. And we can see an even better depiction of that instead of me pointing behind me, but we can see that here. So we have, again, our groups or, or families sometimes split into what we call main group here in A, then our transition metals, group Bs, then our periods and so forth. And then we can sort of see this, a similar depiction here. And so that is all for today. Uh, so just to, to go back and look at what we, what we have talked about today is we talked a lot about atomic structure, the basic parts of an atom, protons and neutrons in the nucleus, electrons on the outside. 
talked about how different numbers of neutrons will lead us to having different isotopes of various elements. And each element will have differing numbers of, of stable isotopes. And those stable isotopes exist in different abundances um, in the universe. And we talked about how we can use those, those different abundances to find blended atomic weights of an element and how we can actually use the blended atomic weight to backtrack and find the different percent abundances. And then we finish just by looking at some various aspects of the periodic table. And so we're starting to get into the thick of things now. Things, things are gonna start building and that's one of the, the things to really be mindful about this course as well, is that things will really start to build on each other quite a bit. You, you won't be able to do some of the things that we talk about later in the course without having a solid foundation of what the atomic number really is and things like that. Uh, and so that's just my little plug to say, don't fall behind. And so as always, any questions, et cetera, feel free to send me an email and I'll see you next time.